86th Psalm. We can read in verse number one. David is uh, the writer of this psalm, and listen as he calls on God. He says, Bow down thine ear, O Lord. Hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, O Lord, art good, and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you, Lord, for those young people over on the other side of the building learning about Jesus. And Lord, some of them tonight have sung and some have played instruments. And Lord, what a blessing. And God, thank you for uh, folks that have a giving spirit. I pray for Jameer. I pray for the Parker family. God, you would help them. God, I don't even begin to understand what they're going through. So I pray you would undergird them with your love and you touch them with your grace. God, I pray for the Harris family. I pray for Sister Harris. You'd help her to recover. I pray for those that have specific needs. God, I pray for the sick and afflicted. Now, Father, help us tonight. The Lord, get a glimpse of thee. God, speak to our hearts. And God, certainly help each and every one where they are with you and where they're at. And God, we pray you'd be glorified. Father, have mercy and give grace in these days. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we ask it all. Amen and amen. In these verses, we notice a few things in this psalm about David. And can I say, David is in a heavy-hearted place. His heart is heavy. He is in a place to where... Uh, the only thing he knows to do is call upon God. I don't know if you've ever been in a place like that, but I'm glad we got a God, Brother Brian, that when we do call upon him, he does hear our prayers. He's in a heavy-hearted place. Uh, David's in a humble place. If you read this psalm, uh, this does not sound like the one who's the king of Israel. This does not sound like the one that used to uh, uh, praise his name, saying that David had his ten thousands that he had slain as the great soldier of Israel. Uh, this did not sound like the one that uh, uh, the Philistines trembled when they heard his name mentioned. No, this is a humbled David. He's in a heavy-hearted place. He's in a humbled place, but he's also in a heralding place. No matter what he is facing, no matter how low he has become, in this psalm, uh, he can't help but brag on the Lord. He can't help but tell of all the greatness uh, of Almighty God. Uh, my dear friends, uh, if you really are in the right relationship with God, it don't matter if you're on the mountain or, on the or in the valley, he's still... Uh, great and esteemed great in your heart and life. Uh, I want to preach for just a few minutes from what David says uh, on this thought. I want to give the testimony of God. The testimony of God. I mean, if God was going to tell you about God, this is what God would have to say. Uh, I like it uh, when I find out a little bit about you, uh, but I really like it when I hear from you what God's done in your life. Uh, I like it when you testify about God. Uh, David's about to do so uh, from the perspective of God. Uh, he's going to give us the testimony of God. Can I say that David reveals uh, that God is good? Uh, look in verse number 5. Uh, For thou, Lord, art good. Uh, can I say he's a good God? Uh, that means he's a righteous God. Uh, that means he excels uh, above anything we can think of as being good. He's a good God. God is good. Hmm? There is no variable or turning with God. 
God can't be tempted of evil. Can I say God can never fail? Uh, God never does anything wrong. Uh, he does all things well, and God is good. Uh, I've been a Christian 47 years as uh, this last week. On Thursday, I celebrated being married for 32 years and celebrated being saved for 47 years, same day. Uh, and my 47 years of being saved and my 34 years of preaching the Word of God, I've heard a lot of people blame God for a lot of things. They lose their job, they'll blame God. Have a loved one die, they'll blame God. Somebody gets sick, they blame God. Somebody, uh, 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 their team don't win the championship. They blame and curse God. I mean, there are people that have blamed God for everything, but David said God's good. He's a good God. Can I say this? David reveals that God is forgiving. Look again at verse number 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. I'm glad he's a forgiving God. I'm glad you don't have to twist his arm to get him to forgive you. Now David said he's ready to forgive. He's looking to forgive. He's longing to forgive. He wants to forgive. Uh, there's not a sinner uh, who's done the most vilest of sins that if he won't come to God, God won't forgive him. Uh, I'm glad he's a forgiving God. He's a good God, but he's a forgiving God. I wish God's people would get that way. Hmm. There's some people, they just they just, just never, ever let something go. Brother Michael Jackson back there committed a sin 30 years ago. Somebody's going to remember it and hold it against him. I'm glad God don't. When he forgives it, it's gone. Yes, sir. He never remembers it anymore. Amen. Huh? He's ready to forgive. It helps some of you all if you'd learn to forgive. Some of you need to learn to forgive yourself. Peter had that problem. That's why three times Jesus had to ask him, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Lord, thou knows all things. Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Uh, God had already forgiven him. But Peter had to forgive himself. Some of you need to learn to forgive yourself. Some of you need to learn to forgive others. This isn't in my notes, but it's, it's good preaching. Huh? You say, you don't know what they've done to me. It don't matter. We are commanded to forgive 70 times 7. You need to forgive. Why? It's not about them, it's about you. When you don't forgive, you get an ulcer. Hmm? Uh, Brother Greg says it this way. Uh, he who angers you controls you. God's a forgiving God. He longs to forgive folks. Aren't you glad for that? That's why you ought to tell folks about Jesus. So they can get forgiven. Mm -mm. Nothing like having your sins washed away. What a blessing to be forgiven. He's a good God. He's a forgiving God. David reveals he's a merciful God. Mm? Hey, grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is holding back what we do deserve. Can I say he's a merciful God? Look at verse 5. He says... Uh, for thou, Lord, art good, ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. He's a merciful God. Look at verse 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. I'm glad for mercy, aren't you? I don't deserve his mercy, but I'm glad for mercy. How many of you ever got away from a whooping you deserved? Three of us in the whole building. We went down there at the Magic Kingdom. After being there 13 hours and walking over 10 miles, I didn't find anything magical about it. <laughs> but only me and my middle boy Christian appreciated the in-depth technology and the wonderful presence of the Country Bear Jamboree. <laughs> and I have been singing that one stupid song ever since that Mama didn't whoop little Buford. 
Huh? What's he say? You ever heard that song? You need to learn it. Mama never whooped little Buford. Mama never cracked him in the head. Mama never whipped little Buford. Mama should just shoot him instead. You know what I'm saying? You need to learn that. That'd be a good possum song. Huh? It's funny. They all come out there on stage. There's one blowing in a jug. There's a one playing a one-string guitar. They're, they're, all, they're all playing something. But they all look like the possums, every one of them. They, look, they even had a little cute one there squeezing a teddy bear at the end. That looked like little Michaela. I mean, that was funny. You know, Miss Nett's filming it. Coming to a Glendale and Dougie show, you know, in the future, do you? You say, what are you talking about? We all face things, and we was hoping for mercy rather than what we deserved. I want to tell you something. God has shown us mercy. God has shown you mercy today. God has withheld wrath from you and your life today. Say, well, I'm one of God's youngins. That didn't help with my mom and dad when I crossed the line. They, they didn't show mercy sometimes. Hmm? I want to tell you something. He's a merciful God. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He still blesses us in spite of how we've treated Him. And can I say this? He's a good God. He's a forgiving God. He's a merciful God. David reveals he's the self-sufficient God. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, For thou art great, and doest wondrous things. And here it is. Thou art God alone. God's the only thing that wasn't created. So when did God begin? He always has been. When does God end? He never will. He's a self-sufficient God. John tells us everything that was made was made by Him. God took nothing and made everything. God doesn't need anyone, but He chooses to allow us to get in on Him. Hmm? He doesn't need anything or anybody. He just chooses to allow, to allow us to hang around. He chooses to allow us to have His forgiveness. He chooses to allow us to be forgiven, redeemed, and chooses us to get to dwell with Him forever. But He don't need any of us. Some of you think that God needs you. No, He don't. But God, in His mercy, allows you and I the privileges of Him. Think about it. Hmm? You ever know somebody that was privileged? Leave it to Donald Trump to know somebody privileged. Huh? I'm talking about somebody that didn't need anything. Somebody could go get anything that they wanted at any time. Privileged. People that don't live like you and I live. Hmm? You know what I notice about a lot of privileged people? They're intolerant of people that aren't privileged. Matter of fact, they tend to look down upon people that are not like them. And can I say this about most privileged people? They didn't earn their privileges. They inherited their privileges. Hmm? But can I say, God allows nobodies to become somebody and live on His privileges. Huh? You can't earn it, but you're going to inherit it. Huh? But He's a self-sufficient God. Hmm? Can I say this? God is full of compassion. Look what the Bible says, verse 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion. Didn't say he had compassion. Said he's full of compassion. John said it this way. For God is love. He's full of compassion. He shows compassion. Can I say... The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God 
loves. Those that become born again take on the nature of God. They ought to be compassionate. You show me somebody that says they're saved, Brother Clint, and they're stingy. They don't want to help. They don't want to do. They don't want to give. I'll show you somebody that's got a problem with God. Hmm? You know, a lot of churches would have had to have a business meeting, announce a quorum three weeks ahead of time, have a business meeting, discuss all the ramifications about whether or not we should give money to this little boy's cause or not. Huh? I ended it a blessing just to say, yeah, let's help them. Huh? You know why I don't fret over asking us to do something? Because I know we're going to do it. Because we're compassionate people. Because we've just hung around God so much, it's starting to happen in our lives, huh? What a blessing. Hmm. Uh, if you're stingy, stingy, old bitty, uh, hang out with somebody like you. I don't care. But this crowd around here, we just want to help people. Hmm. Oh, but Jackie, she don't like to help nobody, but everybody else likes to help people. God's full of compassion. God, the songwriter wrote it this way, God looked beyond our faults and saw our need. Boy, I'm not real good at that. I want to be good at that, but I'm not real good at that. I want to look beyond the exterior and see the need of the interior. That's what God does because He's full of compassion. Can I say God is gracious? Look again in verse 15. Look what it says. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious. He don't give us what we deserve. He gives us grace. You realize under the law, none of us would be able to even enter God's sanctuary because we're a bunch of Gentile dogs. We had no right or claim to the promises of Abraham. But I'm glad that God, through Jesus Christ, made a way of grace. It's not a way of law. If it was a way of law, we'd be in trouble. But it's a way of grace because God is gracious. And God says, hey, whosoever will, come on in. Huh? He's a gracious God. I'm glad He's a gracious God. Can I say this? God is long-suffering it means He suffers long for us. It means He tolerates a whole lot, hoping that the light bulb comes on and we get it. Look what it says there in verse 15. He says, you're full of compassion, you're gracious God, and long-suffering. Long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. He is a long-suffering God. Patience is just the beginning with God. He goes far beyond patience. He is long-suffering. He works and calculates and orchestrates things in our lives to bring us to a point where we'll get it. He's just long-suffering. He just says, well, maybe not today, but maybe tomorrow, and he just keeps working and keeps working and keeps working. I don't know about you, but I'm not very patient. But I'm glad God's long-suffering. Hmm? And can I say, he also says that God is not only merciful, as we saw earlier, but he's plenteous in mercy and truth. Look at verse 15. O Lord... Behold thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Can I say, He's not only merciful, He's plenteous in mercy and truth. Without truth, we'd never know about mercy. and Without mercy, we'd never be recipients of the truth. The truth will set us free. I almost preached a message today on the truth. I was working on one while I was gone. I got some notes on one. But all I'm going to say is the truth is liberating. And I'm thankful for truth. It's hard to find truth in this day and age. You know, I, I really wonder 
are they telling us the truth about the coronavirus? Are they telling us the truth about the vaccine? And how many masks are we going to have to wear before Fauci is satisfied? Huh? I mean, if it was so good, why do I even have to wear one if you got one on? Now you got to wear two, three, ten. Can I help you something? My nose and my lips are big enough as it is. You get a mask out here, I'm going to look ridiculous, huh? I'm going to look like two clan Sam. Seriously, I can't breathe with one of them on. Hmm? Put uh, two or three on. I think they're just messing with us to see how far we'll follow them. Hmm? Listen, I don't know that he was much better, but I tend to believe he was. Walter Conkright, I believe, told the truth when he gave us the evening news. These jokers today, I don't believe they tell us the truth. I don't think most of them know themselves. They just look for pretty people who know how to read. Huh? Somebody writes it, they just read it. But the truth, it's hard to find. Can I say, I remember a time when you could go into just about any church and hear truth. Can I say, this day and age, you're hard-pressed to find a church that'll stand and preach the truth. Huh? I'm amazed at how many churches now think you've got to have a rock band in order to have church. Huh? I'm amazed at how many think that you need to have humanism 101 to appeal to people's intellects so that people will keep coming back. You know what people want? Truth. Truth. Hmm? This world has gone so political that it's even filtered into churches. But God is plenteous in mercy and truth. You want to have a relationship with God, you've got to get honest. You've got to come to the truth of some things. And can I say this? You know why people don't like the truth, Miss Billy? Because truth hurts sometimes. You know, I look in that mirror and I see Robert Redford. <laughs> and then my darling wife reminds me, nope, not even close. Uh, but she does quote a line from a movie. She says, that'll do, pig, that'll do, huh? <laughs> that was Babe. It was great acting in that movie, Ray. Go watch it. You'll love it, huh? That pig, man, he's almost as good as Arnold Zeffel. Google Arnold Zeffel, but you don't know who he is, huh? Uh, was that not the worst television show ever, Green Acres? But Mr. Haney, I've known people like Mr. Haney. Uh, like Zsa Zsa Gabor was ever going to move out to the Green Acres. Like, uh, God is plenteous in mercy. And he's full of truth. We see that in David giving a testimony of God, what he's doing is he's revealing that God is righteous, that God is reliable, and that God's to be revered above all others. Doesn't matter about his circumstances. Again, he's in a hard place. But he's still saying God is worthy to be revered. In David's description of God, he's letting us know that God is imminent, that he's extensive, and that he's exceptional beyond description. I mean, really, how can we describe the greatness and the magnitude of God. Look into a beautiful sunset and just realize that's just God showing off. I mean, how do you really describe the one that is altogether lovely? There are not adjectives in our language to be assigned to how truly great and awesome and loving and gracious God really is. He's exceptional beyond description. But I want you to notice David's request. That's where I wanted to get to all along. Look at verse 17. 
David has described all this about God. He's been talking to God. And he says this, Show me a token for good, that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because thou, Lord, hast hope in me and comforted me. Now David is requesting some things from God. He's requesting that God will make him a symbol. Look again. He says, show me a token for good. He's requesting that God makes him a token or a symbol of what is good and righteous about God. You and I that know the Lord are called Christian. That means to be Christ-like. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 5 that we are the light of the world. And a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And we are to shine our lights. He said that we are the salt of the earth. And that if a salt has lost its savor, it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out. So we are to be light and to be salt. In other words, we are to be a token or a symbol of the greatness of God. That God can reach down into a low pit and pull us up uh, out of the pit. Uh, sorry, no good sinners. Uh, and cleanse us in His own blood. Uh, make us a new creature. Uh, put song of praise in our lips. Uh, and change us to show the world what God can do. Can I say, the rainbow ain't God's greatest handiwork. A sunset's not God's greatest handiwork. God's greatest handiwork is that he can take the most vilest offender and make him fit for the kingdom of heaven. We're to be a token, a symbol of the goodness of God. David also requests that God would make him a stumbling block. Look what he says. Verse 17, show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed. Now David's saying, don't make me a stumbling block that people can't get to you, but make me a stumbling block for those that hate me, those that have judged me wrongly, those that have found fault and error in me, when they see the goodness of God in me, it'll be a stumbling block for them and they can't keep hating me that they'll be ashamed of their actions. Can I help you with something as Christians? We're not to defend ourselves. That's God's business. We're just to shine and be salt. He said, having done all to stand, stand therefore. We're just to stand, be at our post. And we should ask God to make us so gracious and such a symbol of light and salt that even those that hate us and everything that we stand for would be ashamed. Hmm? And then we find that David not only asked God to make him a symbol and ask him to make him a stumbling block, but he also said, make me a standard. Look what he said in verse 17. I'll be done. Show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because thou, Lord, hast hope in me and comforted me. He said, make me a standard. Show what you have done in me because thou hast hope in me and comforted me. Now, if you read most... Bible commentators they're going to say where it says hoping means help to me well listen I think God's a little bit smarter than us and if God wanted to say that he helped us he would have had David pin down help I think God knows the difference between help and hoping the problem is if you grab your Webster dictionary you're not going to find hoping in there you got to get an old Webster dictionary you got to go and realize and get you a, a Hebrew lexicon to realize what that word means. It don't mean helped. 
He said, make me a standard because you're good. Make me a standard because thou hast opened me and comforted me. Now, what we say at the beginning, David's heavy-hearted. David's in a hard place, but David's in a heralding place. David begins to brag on the Lord. How many times have you heard me to bring out Isaiah 61, 3? God has given us a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. How many times have you told, heard me tell you when you get in a low place, when you get down, when you get to, uh, uh, just uh, down and out, start bragging on the Lord, and when you do, He'll lift your spirit. David starts out in a hard place. He's heavy-hearted. He's low but he starts bragging on the Lord. And he ends his psalm saying, Thou hast hope in me and comforted me. He's no longer in that heavy-hearted place. Make me the standard that everybody else can learn the secret how to get out of the mully grubs in your low place, how to get out of the valley and get to, to a place where you're comforted. So what does that word hope in mean? That word hoping means surrounded. He says, Thou hast surrounded me and comforted me. I don't know about you. But I, when I, I know when I had surgery two years ago, and I woke up, at, woke up in ICU, and I woke up with a feeding tube, and I woke up with doctors telling me I'm going to be in this state for three or four days. But I looked around, and I, I saw my darling wife, and I saw my children surrounding me, and that helped me deal with the situation. And can I help you with something? The next time you're in the valley, the next time you feel like the sun's never going to shine again, the next time that uh, uh, you think this might be the last time uh, and that you're going down, uh, if you'll start calling on the Lord, uh, you'll start bragging on the Lord, tell Him how good He is, uh, how merciful He is, uh, how gracious He is, uh, how undeserving you are. Uh, you'll find out, friend, uh, in the midst of your calamity, uh, God will surround you uh, and God will comfort you. Uh, and in the presence of God, there's help. Uh, like you've never known. I'm glad when He opens us, when He just surrounds us. When He hedges you in, friend, the devil can't get you anymore. Those that hate you can't get you anymore because the presence of God is so flooding and overwhelming in your life. Nothing else matters. He says, make me a standard. Let others know the secret. That if they'll just start bragging on God and testifying about God, God will inhabit their praise and He'll surround them and comfort them. Friend, the secret to joy in this life is learning David's secret. And that's bragging on the Lord. Brings His presence in your life. And then nothing else matters. I wonder tonight, When's the last time you just openly bragged on God? When's the last time in the midst of your hurt and your anguish and your pain, you just crawled up somewhere and started talking to God and started bragging on Him, thanking Him for how good He was? Because, friend, I've learned when I get low, if I make much of Him, I don't stay low long. I find help from the glory world. And friend, you live long enough, you're going to need help from the glory world. Some of you might need help from the glory world tonight. It's available. His name is Jesus. When you come to the end of you, and you make much of Him, friend, you'll find that He'll surround you too. Maybe tonight, you need Him to flood you. Ask Him to make you a symbol. Ask Him to make you a stumbling block to those that hate the cause of Christ, but ask Him to make you the standard to show others how great God really is. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, get a song of invitation. If you enjoyed today's message, head Folks on over. are already coming to the altar, and they're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, we can testify, as David did, that you're all those things. You are gracious. You are good. You are long-suffering. You are merciful. You are plenteous in mercy and truth. God, you're just so wonderful. 
And we bless you for the great things you've done in our lives. And God, there are times when we need you to surround us and comfort us. Lord, I'm thinking right now that song Brother James sang just a little bit ago, The Lord is my shepherd. In a world full of grief, you comfort us. And God, we bless you. and We praise you for being our God. Now, Lord, if there's somebody here tonight just struggling, need some help, I pray that God, they'd find the secret David did, help cometh from God. I pray that you would help them and comfort them like you did David. Maybe somebody's facing something. Just need to talk to the Lord. I pray that, God, they just find themselves in an altar and talk to the Lord. God, maybe somebody here has been wrong. I got an unforgiving spirit. God, I pray that, God, you deal with them. Convict them so they can get it made right. God, whatever is needed, I pray your will be done. There's somebody here not saved. I pray they get saved. God, we just pray the perfect will of God be accomplished in this service. Get glory to your name and we'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.